Hello everyone and welcome to a very special video. Last month I approached Chase Jones, the lead designer of Epic Mickey, with a proposal to do a live commentary video. The idea is you often see filmmaker commentaries on DVDs, but seldom do games include anything similar. So I thought it might be neat to hear a little bit of you know, his insight into the development of the game, how something's changed, and Chase has always been very involved with the Epic Mickey community uh, over the years. He's been happy to answer different questions I've had, so I want to extend a huge thank you to him for sitting down to chat with me, and without further ado, uh, on with the video. So, what was your, how, how did this uh, opening to Epic Mickey come about? Uh, like, at what stage in development did you guys come up with starting like this? Uh, it was pretty early on, actually, wanting to, you know, have him come in and, and start kind of in peril. Uh, you know, it's a little bit more engaging when, when the player has something to, some sort of threat. So it took a little bit of iteration to get to this version, but it was, it was pretty much the plan from the start. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, some of the different iterations that there might have been of this? Um, we just tried different things. It wasn't, you know, with the mechanical arm and the room changed shape a bunch of times as, you know, we we're trying to get the camera angles correct um, where we wanted uh, kind of hints of, of tune that could be thinned out. And then also uh, Gus originally wasn't going to be in the game leading you uh, that came on a little bit later and so once we kind of decided on that it was you know how is he going to lead the player through um, as well as what basic mechanics did we need to show off in this room versus the the subsequent rooms originally the door that you're going through now is supposed to be uh, thinned out when we had um, the brush in this room like that when you got oh, really mm-hmm uh, but that changed because we just wanted the exploration, right? If people stuck around uh, and decided to, to look around, then you get a little bit of rewards and kind of learn that. This is one of the few places in the game um, where we actually force you to either paint or thin. Most of the time it's a, it's a choice and there's, there's a equal output. But because it's a tutorial, we had to put in just these two places, which was... Uh, not something we wanted to do, but something we needed to do. So how did how did you decide to uh, start out with Sears here? Because I've noticed in the second game, uh, there aren't actually any Sears. They were one of the ones that gave you, you know, a good amount of warning before anything happened. Uh, right. So when you're coming into fighting something for the first time, um, you know, we wanted something that didn't immediately kind of attack you and that you could... Uh, you could judge what you were about to do or what was about to happen. We just got introduced to Guardians for the first time. So from what I understand, um, kind of the play style matters mechanics kind of evolved into that. Um, can you tell me a bit about uh, the different stages of that that led you to towards Guardians? Um, I mean, we wanted to kind of keep the keep everything in the environment, but that's not always apparent to most players so giving a little bit of a hint of what could be painted or what could be thin and having these influences in the world that you know possibly have influence or, or you know consequence in the world um, to show that evolution there's a lot stronger uh, themes of the world kind of evolving and devolving early on but the week could only handle so much um, but this also let us have hints to guide the player without using, you know, full what I call golden arrows. A lot of games they'll put that that marker um, to constantly tell you where to go, and we didn't want to do that. We just kind of wanted to put little hints around. So uh, these guys came about because of that. We wanted it to be about exploration as well as the adventure. So. Um, didn't want to take that away by just always pointing the player at where they wanted or where we needed them to go. This is kind of a, our first big decision, right? Mm-hmm. And so how did this come about? Were there any other iterations of this or was it always flinging a gremlin from a catapult? Um, that gag had been in the game in some form or fashion. Uh, we had it in demos and we had it in playables. 
but we never really found the appropriate place for it. And so when we started talking about like how are we going to present the player with, like you said, their first moral choice, um, one of the designers thought, well, why don't we put this here uh, and give the player the ability to either get the get the treasure or get the gremlin. And you didn't want it to be based, based on paint and thinner because even though those are tools that, is, that are associated with, with the destruction uh, versus the restoration, the moral choice comes down to the player and to, to Mickey. So that's why we didn't want to use the paint and thinner because you had that, that universal theme for the paint and thinner. If you didn't want to get the, the treasure chest or even save the gremlin, you could have just left through the, um, through the projector. So we wanted to make sure that the, it was always open for the player to decide how they wanted to go through. And if those choices were overwhelming or not ones they wanted to make, then you could always bypass it and, and keep going. You just didn't get the pin. Uh, I'm curious, during play testing, uh, what did you see uh, play testers lean towards? Did you see, uh, did you see more of them uh, fling the gremlin from the catapult or uh, did you see more of them get the e-tickets? Most of them freed the gremlin to begin with. When they saw other testers fling the gremlin, you had people going after that because it was funny. The humor was there. Um, right. The other thing was is, you know, e-tickets have no value right now. And so you, don't, you didn't know what you were going to get out of the treasure chest or how you would use them. Uh, so it was kind of an unfair choice because... Because of Gus, you perceive the gremlins as, as, as people, as characters, as things to care about right. inherently. Um, so, but you know Treasure Chest is kind of going to push greed or not. So it, it has a little bit of a visual cue, but it was still, uh, again, a little unfair. <laughs> um, can you tell me how this area came about? Um, well, like I always wanted to do Neverland and there's a there's a version early early on where we were going to do more of Neverland um, because Skull Island like it's so iconic and then when you start talking about the animatronic bosses right with with Hook um, this is where you would go to pursue them so mainly this level always started off with you know with the skull uh, and then everything else kind of expanded from there we knew we wanted to have the animatronic pirates, um, the splatters being dressed up, right? Because we wanted it to be about the, the ride. Uh, actually, I think their costumes came from the first version of this level. Uh, when we started thinking about what we wanted to do with Skull Island, one of the artists created the little splatter with the pirate outfit. And that turned into a whole thing for the rest of the game. But this is where it started with them. This was the level when, when we started putting it together that they put them in that, those outfits. And then, of course, everybody was like, we need a small world one and we need uh, a Haunted Mansion one. Um, so they wouldn't have had their, their special costumes, I, I don't think, if we wouldn't have started here. Uh, but this one, this one was tricky because we wanted to put more into it than the Wii could actually hold. Keeping the rest of the skull intact uh, we had to figure out, you know, how do you showcase a different route and that, that kind of stair step off to your right, um, off to the right of the skull wasn't always there. It used to be a little bit further back because we didn't want to ruin the silhouette of the, the skull, but people were noticing it. And so we had to bring some of the elements forward. You know, we are going for more, um, the philosophy of most of the game is, uh, you know, you're going to have platforming versus combat most of the time. When you look around, you'll have that exploration uh, that can lead you into combat if you continue to follow the platforming uh, elements as opposed to staying on safe ground. Uh, it's going to lead you to more platforming, but less enemies. So as we evolved the island, it just became more and more of that and then little secrets and we wanted to hide the different pins and, and rewards. Uh, to move you around the board. But this was an interesting one because it was one of the few levels that was actually circular. Yeah, and it was a lot simpler when it started. When we started putting in more of the um, 
the other quests and mini objectives. We got we got a lot more to explore, which was really nice. I liked the more and more that we added to it, but with the memory of the Wii, we had to be careful. Um, but yeah, I wanted there to be so many more islands to this. So how, how often was uh, were hardware restrictions on the Wii? How often did that kind of uh, prevent you from doing things or have to scale down a bit? Uh, a lot. The, the Wii couldn't handle a whole lot. And it prevented us from doing a lot of the things we wanted to do, but it also evolved the game in a lot of neat ways, right? We couldn't do, originally the game was supposed to be a pure open world game, but with the changes to the geometry, the paint and the thinner changes, um, and all of the different worlds that we wanted to have, we just didn't have enough room uh, or the ability, the technology at the time to do a full open world. So we had to cut it down to levels. Um, the levels we wanted to have a little bit more contiguous, but those, again, got restricted because of how many characters we could have on, on the map, how many things could be changed on the map, uh, which now that we were no longer doing a full open world game, we had to figure out ways to move back and forth. And you couldn't, with the engine that we were using, you couldn't have uh, enemies, too many enemies loaded in at the same time. And when you were loading the game, it had to get rid of enemies from behind and then load up the enemies in front. But it didn't always have knowledge of that. So one of the great things about those restrictions is that's where the the 2D projection levels came in. Because we couldn't, we had to have levels, transition levels, that didn't have any enemies in it. And instead of just doing a blank corridor, we came up with the DECs and the, the film projectors um, in order to make that happen. So in some ways we got a lot of restrictions, in other ways we got a lot more uh, interesting gameplay, I thought. There was a part of... Um, Oztown, where we were going to put Mickey's house in, and uh, because you know it was based off of Toontown, and we had modeled one of the houses off of the earlier houses off of the off of Disney World in Orlando, and talking to the parks people, they're like, nope, um, they're like that is first of all that's not Mickey's house, that's Mickey's vacation house. Mickey's house is in, in Anaheim at Disneyland. And therefore you cannot also have that model in the game uh, because it wouldn't be forgotten and that's not where Mickey lives. So like the way that they kind of bring their own belief into Disney as employees, we wanted to bring to the characters as well, right? They were, they were, aware of everything outside of them because basically the company's emotion gives them that that life and that realization so how closely uh was disney involved uh in the creation of this game um they were involved i mean every step of the way right like we had the there's a guy who signs off on everything mickey mouse and he had to come to the studio and sign off on the color red that we were using for Mickey's pants. Really? Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, must make it interesting for your texture texture artists. Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, we had to show them, you know, the hex values of the red that we were using because TVs show things off different ways. Maybe there's something about this one in particular. Well, my favorite was Skeleton Dance. <laughs> that was my favorite one to do. That, that's my favorite cartoon in general, so I, I was really happy to see that in the game. That was my wife's favorite, and uh, so I put it in there for her. Um, and her birthday is actually one of the dates on the beginning calendar, too. So there's a oh, bunch really? of little things from the devs in those. Like, all of those dates on the calendar mean something to one of the dev people. I do remember we were looking, because we wanted to use the old cartoons, um, and a lot of the original ones, much like uh, Skeleton Dance, were left to right. Um, 
when I started looking at how the levels were connected, uh, there were some of them that made sense to go vertical when you actually look at the 3D levels and, and kind of where they're at from the overall map and park perspective. So uh, Clock Cleaners was one, of the, was one of the original vertical levels that we decided to test because uh, it didn't really have, like it had a lot of neat mechanics that we could, we could pull just from a platformer perspective, right? The gears that twist up and down, the, um, the platforms that drop and spin, uh, but it didn't have a whole lot of other elements to it. And so uh, with that, it allowed us to experiment with what we actually wanted for the rest of them. There was a point in time, which a lot of people will, um, I think would be interested in. There, early on, there was a point in time where the 2D levels, we actually allowed you to, to use the brush. We couldn't lock the aiming in a, in a reasonable way to, to pure 2D. So um, the, it was very frustrating to, to try to aim the brush where you actually wanted it to go. Um, and so we just took it out because the interactions, like I said, we were trying to do things to, to conserve on memory and, and to make sure that we could load the levels um, that they were connecting to, to the right place. So uh, yeah, we took them out for a bunch of reasons. And we wanted to make them a little bit more colorful or even black and white. And black and white was hard to do when you're talking about the difference between uh, what's paintable and, and thinnable. So I guess that's where we'll end off. Uh, thank you so much for having a chat with me about uh, kind of how some things changed, uh, your design perspective on this stuff. Uh, it's been awesome having you. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and thanks for reaching out. A uh, little trip down memory lane and uh, always happy to support the community. I mean, you guys are great. Uh, everything that you've done. I, I think I've said it on, on the chats, but I never would have imagined when I was working on this that this would have been as big as it is so um <laughs> it's kind of weird to step years. away from it and then come Ten back years later too yep so uh, and i love everybody wants to see a three i hope it happens at some point in time but um yeah it'd be sad to, to watch this franchise disappear